Gloria Schmidt is our speaker tonight. We met in 1995 when my first my oldest child was going to Elmhurst School. She is the former Elmhurst School librarian, and her um, devotion to history and researching the local history stories began when she was teaching the students there. She has been a member of the Portsmouth Historical Society for 20 years, some of those on the board and always on the curator committee. Um, we have, she has a very popular blog, PortsmouthHistoryNotes.com, and is very generous sharing that information with us and the world. Um, the, uh, actually, the Newport County Board of, um, Newport County Board, and then I'm going to say that's my job. Um, Legal women voters of Newport County have relied heavily on Gloria's research and, and shared it, um, profusely and why they couldn't be here, but they wanted me to thank Gloria on their behalf tonight. So thank you for that. Um, we also have a very popular series uh, that Gloria and her husband, Richard Schmidt, is also on our curating committee and has been a 20 year member. But Gloria does a lot of the research. Um, with, uh, they did a collaboration with the Portsmouth Community Theater. Um, for taking Portsmouth history on the road, and they actually have produced um, three-minute plays with people in costume about all the different kinds of things located around Portsmouth. They're really cool. You could get a lot of hits on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, go to our go to our um, web page, and you'll find them there. And they're on YouTube. And we will also put that in the newsletter. So, without further ado. And the women of the Newport County Women's Suffrage League. So before I start, I, I wanted to, you to know how this presentation began and how so many of our, our other uh, research presentations begin. They begin with objects, photos. Uh, paintings, documents that are in our collection because these are the things that uh, get us started on the stories. We look at something and we wonder, well, what does this have to do with Portsmouth? And two of the, or, or four of the people that I'm going to feature tonight, I met through objects in our collection. We have a portrait downstairs of an elderly woman making a vegetarian Thanksgiving meal. And through that portrait, I got to know Sarah James Eddy. I was scanning photos to keep uh, for our collection. And I come, came across that photo of the three women with their uh, suffrage sashes on. And I came to know these ladies. And so that was the beginning. So I have been researching one or another of these ladies for maybe six or seven years. But this last year I have been really working hard because this is the, the centennial celebration. And we really wanted to know not just the ones that uh, were most prominent, but the other ladies, the Portsmouth ladies. So I'm going to talk about the Portsmouth ladies. It's, it's actually Portsmouth women vote. And I am going to talk about the Portsmouth women that were in this group and also what it was like for them to cast that first vote. If you want to learn about Portsmouth history, join the Curators Committee. This is from the Diary of Abby Sherman, November 2nd, 1920. Today we cast our first ballot, the women of Portsmouth. Everything was conducted in a quiet manner. It was the greatest event of our lives. Some of the women in the Newport County Women's Suffrage League are prominent. You know about Julia Ward Howe, you might recognize the name of Maud Howe Elliott, her, her uh, daughter. But a lot of these other women are remembered only by their families. And um, 
a lot of these descendants have absolutely no idea that great grandma was a suffragist. So what I am going to read to you is from the history of women's suffrage that was written by the suffragists themselves. Among the nerve centers of suffrage activity in Rhode Island, the Newport County Women's Suffrage League had a definite place from its founding in 1908 by Miss Cora Mitchell, its first president. The league's work was at first largely carried on by an active group of philanthropic women of Bristol Ferry, Miss Mitchell's friends and neighbors, among whom were Miss Sarah Jayetti, Mrs. John Eldridge, and Mrs. Barton Ballou. Gradually, the suffrage agitation spread over the entire island, which includes the three townships of Portsmouth, Middletown, and Newport. Mrs. Julia Ward Howe was present at the first meeting, and as long as she lived, took great interest in the work. The summer meetings were sometimes held at Oak Glen, Portsmouth, Mrs. Howe's country home, and on soft June afternoons, the veteran suffrage workers and the young neophytes destined to carry on the work rejoiced in coming together. So this is a passage that is full of information to get us started. And the picture that you see there is Oak Glen. It is just up the street. It was Julia Ward Howe's home. And uh, this was my starting point. What I did as, as I would come across newspaper articles and I would find names, I couldn't find the names of those that just attended meetings, but I did find the names of those that were officers or, or went as a delegate to a conference. So I gathered those names. So I gathered 40 names that um, I worked with and tried to find what their stories were. I wasn't just interested in how the organization ran. I was interested in the women. I wanted to know who they were. I wanted to know what role they had in the Portsmouth community. And that's what I, I tried to, to find. Well, let's begin with Julia. Julia was a national leader with a long experience. And so she brought to this little group on Aquidneck Island all that background, knowing all of that, having the connections. So this little group on Bristol Ferry had, uh, ha had a number of advantages. They had people there that could give them the national message. They had people among their midst that were active in the Rhode Island State Suffrage League. So they had the connection. Bristol Ferry was a very special place with uh, a transportation hub. And so I think that entered into it too. But they were interested in more than just the vote. They were interested in the lives of women and the rights of women too. Julia was a 50-year summer resident of Portsmouth. And before that, she came to Portsmouth from her infancy on because the Ward family had really deep connections with Rhode Island. So she, she was one of us. She was part of our island and definitely a part of, of Portsmouth. And her story illustrates the importance of rights of women in, in general. Julia was married to Samuel Gridley Howe, and he was a very important person on his own. But he had a philosophy that a lot of men had at the time, that women should derive all of, uh, all of their energy from and to their family, that this should be the center of the woman's life. Julia had other ideas. Julia loved to write. She loved to write poetry. She wrote plays. She was a very literary woman. 
but her husband would not allow her to publish. So what did Julia do? She learned stealth. She went to a publisher and had her poetry works published anonymously. She didn't care if she got credit. She just wanted her poetry out there. Now, one of the things that we don't understand in our generation now is what the role of women and, and what their rights were in um, the 19th century. And for example, the men had the rights to the children, not the woman. The men had the property, not the women. And so, even if a woman went out and worked, her salary went to her husband. So this was you know, a very difficult thing. They had the rights to the children, and um, Samuel Gridley Howe would use that as a lever to get Julia to do things. If you don't do this, I'm going to take your eldest son, and I'm going to move him away. You don't think about Julia Ward Howe living in that kind of environment. And there were so many women of that time that didn't have those rights, didn't have the property rights, didn't have the rights to their own children. So Julia said, even women of fortune possessing nothing individually after their marriage, the ring which promised to endow them with all the earthly goods really endowed him all that belonged to them, even to the clothes that they wore. The children were not their own. The father could dispose of them as he might think fit. And in fact, when her husband died, I think it was around 1876, she said, I began my new life today. So it's very hard for us to think of that. But you can understand why she had a passion for women and, and their rights at that point. So during the Civil War, the women's suffrage movement was kind of put aside. There were more important things going on. And after the war, they started to organize and be more active. Now, I never really realized that there were divisions among the suffragists until I started doing my research. And what I, what I found was um, two distinct groups that kind of grew out of divisions. And um, think of it as Julia's group and Susan B. Anthony's group. So I think it's important for us to understand what their beliefs and tactics were, because you can understand more about what the Newport County Women's Suffrage Group was thinking, because they were following um, Julia's lead in this. So Julia's group, the American women, okay, you could say the American team and the national team if you want. Julia's group was headquartered in Boston. Susan's group was headquartered in New York. So you had a difference in, in styles between Boston and New York. Um, Julia's group focused on the vote for women and curiously enough, didn't focus as much on the rights of women at that stage. They were kind of focused on, on, the, um, on the voting issue. Susan's group was very, very uh, focused also on women's rights. Julia's group was looking at a state-by-state -state adoption of the vote for women. Susan's group was looking nationally. So what Julia's group was trying to do is, okay, let's go and we'll work in Rhode Island and we'll get the state legislature to uh, enact votes for women here. And we'll kind of pick it off state-by-state-by-state. By state by state. And the other group wanted to do this as a constitutional amendment, kind of from the top down. So there were, there were divisions 
um, um, among them for a long time. Um, the uh, Julius group supported the Republican Party because they were more uh, sympathetic to the vote for women. And the uh, Susan's group was trying to work with both the Democrats and the Republicans, trying to, to work in that way. Um, this is very important. Julia's group used a delegate system. They were kind of from the bottom up. So you had these leagues. This was the Newport County League, and then they would meet and uh, send delegates to the state conference, and then the state conference would send delegates to the national conference. So it was kind of from the bottom up. Susan's group, it was more from the top down. And um, men were full members of Julia's group. In fact, there were some men in the Newport County uh, Women's Suffrage League. In Susan's group, there were no men. It was all women. And um, the Julia's group was the more conservative group, not as, as um, uh, extreme in its tactics as the other group. And um, they were opposed to a lot of confrontation. And they each published a journal. So you can see that there were divisions. So even though you had Susan B. Anthony and Julia as, as leaders, you didn't have them cooperating or meeting together for a long time. And then finally, in around 1890, they decided, ah, you know, we're kind of bending towards each other. We can do better together. So in, um, they merged together in the National American Woman Suffrage Association. This is Julia Ward Howe's parlor up the street in Oak Glen. And Julia is sitting there in the parlor, if you can see her there. And uh, we have from a letter of Susan B. Anthony to her sister, I went in a carriage one afternoon to call on Julia Ward Howe, whose summer home is six miles from here. She was charming, and I had an interesting time. So there was a meeting of the two, and, and that seems to be a monumental thing that there would be a meeting of Susan B. Anthony and Julie Ward Howe here in Portsmouth in 1902. So to finish off on Julia a little bit, Julia died in 1910, but up until the very end, she was a speaker and a spokesman. One of the last things that she did was the 1909 Marble House conference that was hosted by Alva Belmont in Newport. So Julia really did, until the very end, work in the suffrage movement. Will you see the portrait? This is uh, commemorating Susan B. Anthony's 80th birthday. And do you see the children in that that are handing flowers to Susan B. Anthony? Those faces are the faces of the children of Bristol Ferry. This is in the National Gallery of Art. And this was painted by Sarah James Eddy. And she's a very important part of our, of our story. She was um, a friend of Susan B. Anthony from uh, her family uh, had an association with her and had given money to her. One of the things that I'll constantly be telling you is that there are generations involved in this. So it would be uh, a mother passing down to a daughter passing down to another. And this was the case where um, uh, Sarah Eddy was very uh, involved in both abolition and suffrage because her parents had a passion for those and had national connections with those. So she had very close ties with Susan, and Susan agreed to come and sit for this portrait. So what you see now is um, Sarah Eddy's house on Bristol Ferry Road. It is 
now made into condominiums. And um, if, if you take a look at the turret room, can you see that? I think that's the room that Susan B. Anthony must have stayed in because she wrote her sister that the slanting rays of the sun shining on Narragansett Bay uh, from all five windows of my big room is the most glorious view imaginable. She stayed at the house for three weeks and they would sit for the portrait in the morning and in the afternoon they would go gallivanting. And they visited uh, they, Ocean Drive and saw the homes of the, Susan called them the nabobs in uh, Newport. And uh, Sarah was a woman of many causes. When Susan was there, she had a woman from the temperance union there and she had a woman from the anti-vivisectional society there as well. Um, Sus uh, Sarah was very passionate about uh, protection of animal rights. So um, she was a vegetarian, and so uh, when she was at the house, Susan would have had a vegetarian diet. And another lady that we'll be talking about, uh, Mrs. Ballou, was next door. And uh, she brought over some roast beef for uh, Susan B. Anthony. and. Uh, for the Sarah's cannibal friends, uh, because they might feel the lacking of some meat in their diet. So I thought that was, that was funny. It was for Sarah's cannibal friends. Sarah Eddy uh, was a photographer, but we only, we only have one picture of her, and this is the one. She was, um, she was the center uh, of this Bristol Ferry community and uh, she had her home there and across the street was what was called a social studio which was an art center and community center for Portsmouth. Wouldn't it be nice if we had an art center and community center in Portsmouth now? We had one in 1900. So she was um, a major contributor uh, to uh, the library. She was a philanthropist but um, she was very involved in the national side of the suffrage movement, uh, the state organization. She had lived in Providence and she, she worked in, in that from her home. And um, she had the Jubilee celebration once the, the victory was won and they, the 19th Amendment passed. The Newport County Women's Suffrage League had a big Jubilee, a big celebration and that was at the social studio across from Julia's place. So she had this family heritage. She was not, um, she, she was not in the foreground. She was always in the background. She was encouraging, she was enabling. But there was one little um, point in which she really uh, made a, 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 an effort to uh, push back. And um, she wrote a letter to the town clerk of Portsmouth refusing to pay her taxes because it was taxation without representation. So that got in the papers. Now, after the women got the vote, the philanthropic Sarah Eddy was, uh, didn't hold any grudges. She presented the town clerk with a very nice storage unit that the town hall needed. So again, she held no grudges. She was, uh, you know, she was a philanthropist in town. She did uh, an awful lot. She put a wing on the, the library. And there's so many uh, other ways I could give an entire talk in the half on uh, Sarah Eddy. Another one that um, was very much in the, in the lead was um, Cora Mitchell. And it wasn't just um, Cora. There was a whole uh, Mitchell family that was involved. Now, um, at that particular time, in 1907, when she started things, the suffrage on Aquidneck Island was not a very popular cause. So you had to kind of have some courage to kind of step out and, and press this and talk about this. And, um, the, the Mitchell women 
had a lot of courage from way back. So, uh, Cora wrote a book about her family experience, experiences in the Civil War. The family was in Apalachicola, Florida, where the father was a cotton merchant. And they got caught at the start of the Civil War and they were not uh, able to get out of there very easily. Now they had a son, Colby, who was 15 or 16. He was in school. And the Confederate soldiers came, they yanked him out of school and they conscripted him into the, into the Confederate Army. Now one day he had fallen ill and was able to come home and uh, Thomas Mitchell scooped him up, uh, made arrangements. They were able to get uh, whatever uh, sailing craft they could uh, get to come up to Portsmouth because Portsmouth was the, the family home of Mrs. Uh, Sophia uh, Br uh, Brownell uh, Mitchell. And so they escaped here. Now that left Mother Sophia with four small children to get out of there. And it was a very tense situation. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, c uh, people were suspicious of them because they were northerners. And um, they really had to make an escape. Uh, and they were on leaky tubs and ferry boats and um, they were in ports that had yellow fever, but they made their way here to Portsmouth and the family settled in that Bristol Ferry area. So I have a great admiration for the whole Mitchell family. And so this was uh, Cora's backbone. And uh, so I, I think that that says a lot about her and, and her courage. Now she's considered the founder of and first president of the Newport County Women's Suffrage League. Some things will say that it was founded in 1907. If you have the, the, the picture, you will see that it says 1907 on their sashes. So they had to have started at least by 1907. And uh, Cora was an active speaker. She was, she would take trips all over. Um, she would uh, go out to the Rhode Island Fair in Washington County. Can you imagine going there in, you know, 1910? Um, and put the table out and try to persuade people to join the suffrage movement. So she was a go-getter. She would go to meetings in, in Tiverton and start meetings there and meetings in Middletown. And she really was an, an organizer. And um, so she was an active speaker, but um, this, is her, this is her home on Bristol Ferry. Uh, and this is her home with Sophie and her other sister, Florie, her older sister, King. And all of these ladies were very active in, in it. Um, Sophie was an artist. Um, she was the treasurer. She hosted meetings there. Florie was supportive. But Daughter um, Clara May Miller was very active and continued on and was vice president even when Maud Howe Elliott was uh, president and things were more in the Newport uh, city than in, in Portsmouth. But um, this whole family was involved in the suffrage movement. Emmeline Eldridge is another one that really made a difference. She might not have been a national leader. She might not have been uh, a state leader, but um, she was a very strong supporter in, um, the, in the Portsmouth community. She was the first woman superintendent of schools at a time when you wouldn't have heard of something like that happening. She was active at St. Paul's and on the library board, but one of her most important role was director of that social studio that I was telling you about. It started around 1900, and um, it was a place where uh, students could learn uh, to do crafts. They did woodworking, they did leather crafting, they did metal crafting, they did painting. There, there were uh, 
all kinds of activities. There were activities for uh, women and, and men gathered there. It was a, a, a prominent spot. Now, Eveline had no children of her own, but she worked with children for 20 years. And as I said, she may not have been a national leader, but she was very important in the Portsmouth community. Another neighbor on Bristol Ferry was Mary Ballou. And Mary Ballou was the one that sent the roast beef over for the uh, cannibals in Sarah's house. Now, she was active in the state organization because she lived half of the year in Providence and half of the year here. Her husband was the owner of uh, Ballou Jewelry. And uh, it was a very prominent firm in, in uh, uh, Providence is very well known for jewelry making, and so this was a company. So she was a lady who was fairly well off. She had tennis courts at her house. She had the first one of the first cars in in, um, in Portsmouth, and uh, but she had been active since she was a young uh, bride in the suffrage movement. So um, when Rhode Island passed a presidential suffrage. Um, bill in 1917, um, she was named by the Providence Journal as a Rhode Island suffrage pioneer. So um, she was interviewed, and this is her remarks. It marks the beginning of the end of what has been for me a long and often hopeless appearing fight. I have worked for suffrage for almost 50 years, and when I celebrate my 80th birthday next week, I will have a real cause for celebration. I hardly expected to live long enough to see old high-bound Rhode Island take its place at the head of the processional of progress in the East. So she had, she eventually, uh, when uh, Maud Howe Elliott moved to Newport, the Ballou family bought Oak Glen. And they continued the work. A lot of these suffragists in Portsmouth ended up very involved in the League of Women Voters. And so a lot of League of Women Voter activities were out of Oak Glen, which is kind of appropriate because that was a, one of the centers for the suffrage movement as well. So if you see this map, this map is from uh, I think it's 1907 or 1910, something around like that. And this was about the time that the Newport County Suffrage, uh, Women's Suffrage League was founded. So I tried to take the names that I had found and try to place them on the map. And I think you can see I've labeled them, I highlighted them in pink. So there were about 16 women that I found in that Bristol Ferry neighborhood that were all involved in um, the Newport County Women's Suffrage League. I couldn't find anybody from South Portsmouth. Uh, the furthest one away was, was uh, uh, on Quaker Hill. But uh, this very, was, very much was a neighborhood thing at first. And this was a very special neighborhood um, when I'm talking to people that are from that area and uh, can tell me about what it was like in the past, it didn't matter whether you were a farmer's wife or the wife of a uh, prominent merchant in, in uh, uh, Providence. Uh, it was a neighborhood that where people spent a lot of time together and so it became a natural environment for, for this group. What? Um, I think he's going, he's going to go south over the summer nature. Okay. I'm going to tell you where you will find I'm all the names. I'm going to tell you where you will find all the names. Remember there were 40 names. Remember there were 40 names. Okay. I, I think later if okay. I put that map up again, you might be able to say that map up again. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's going to be good. Well, hopefully there will be a way for you to see it. And, and I'll let you know. So. I was getting confused. I had too many ladies. And I had to kind of make my own database. 
So this is an example of what I was trying to do. So I had the member, I had the husband's name because sometimes when you're looking for people, you're not finding them under, you know, the lady's name. You're finding them under, you know, Mrs. Uh, John Eldridge. So I try to do that. Their birth date, their death dates, um, what role they had, and I was especially interested in what they did in the community because I, 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 was, I was interested in how involved they were in, in the Portsmouth community. One of the ladies that I've just uh, been researching, her name is Lillian Wheeler Boone. She was one of the youngest members of this particular group. And um, she was, uh, I, I had the privilege of actually listening to her voice because her granddaughter had a, uh, old uh, uh, um, tape that someone had done for their senior project and they interviewed her. And so I could hear her voice and I could hear her talk about her experience with the suffrage movement itself. And you know, it, was, it was really um, interesting to me. This is an example of someone who after uh, the vote was won, she was very active in Republican politics she was very active in uh, a number of things in, in the town, started her own newspaper, started her own uh, real estate and insurance company. She was a really active woman. And one of the things there under community work said that she was a World War I volunteer. And I kept finding that with the women. And um, what was happening was when World War I began, the women toned down their efforts at suffrage. They devoted a lot of effort into helping with the war effort. Uh, and, and they would do it in the ways they could. They would uh, entertain soldiers and sailors. They would you know, do paperwork. Uh, they would uh, be clerks and, and things like that. But it was a very important thing because I think it let other people know that women had a role in our society and there were jobs that women could do even in the war effort. So um, Lillian actually met her husband in one of these uh, World War I uh, events. And so she was, she was one that I've just uh, researched. Hannah Hall Sisson was really interesting to me because I knew what Julia went through in around 1870 or so, 60s and 70s. But Hannah Hall Sisson had to go through that still. Things had changed somewhat, but the woman's role was not entirely uh, uplifted. Um, she was separated from her husband. She had to bring her husband to court to get custody of her daughter because it was assumed that the man had custody of the children. She had, and this was even after she had separated from her husband, and her husband took that property and he was um, disposing of it at his own will. She had to bring him to court to get um, title to the, the property that she had uh, inherited. So things changed somewhat but for Hannah Hall Sisson, you can understand why she might be involved in a, in a push for women's votes and a voice for women, because she was still experiencing some of those problems that Julia had experienced. But I've got um, Edith Evans Chase. She was a Girl Scout leader, involved in the Girl Scout movement, St. Paul's. A lot of these ladies were involved in St. Paul's. Pearl Hicks was a Bristol Ferry school teacher, just like Lillian Wheeler Boone had been a Bristol Ferry school teacher. And uh, she was the wife of the town clerk. Marjorie Hicks Tallman was her daughter, again, another generation working in that. She was um, a local pianist and active in the temperance movement. And then Hannah was uh, active at St. Paul's and very active in the Red Cross. Red Cross, St. Paul's, the library, these ladies were very active in the community. So a few other Portsmouth women. 
Um, Gertrude MacUmber Hammond, I had researched. I have a passion to unearth the stories of Portsmouth women. And Gertrude MacUmber Hammond was the founder of the Girl Scouts in Portsmouth. She had the very first troop. And a lot of these ladies that were active with her in the suffrage movement helped her out with the Girl Scouts. So you, know, you, will, you will see an overlap with that. Uh, she, along with um, Lillian, were charter members, uh, founders of the Portsmouth Historical Society, and they were act very active in trying to get Founders Brook so that we still have that today. So they were you know, very involved. Veva Stores was the wife of the local doctor, and she was trying to do things like getting school nurses to come in and see the children in school. So again, she was, she was a charter member of the Historical Society. She was a secretary of the library. She was in the Art Association at St. Paul's. Active women, all of them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Abby Sherman later on. Her, um, her, hus her husband and son were in state politics. She was among the founders of the library, active in the DAR and the Women's Christ, uh, 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 Christian Temperance Union. And um, you know we will read some more of her diary in a little bit. Uh, Edith um, Clark, uh, again, St. Paul's Red Cross. And Frances Sisson Faulkner is a really interesting lady um, because she, in, in reading her story, I got acquainted with her daughter who um, went over to England, came back, and called herself Lady Cameron, and um, told everyone, she was a travel writer, told everyone that she was from Portsmouth, but Portsmouth, England, not Portsmouth, <laughs> Rhode Island. So Maud Howe Elliott is uh, another one. Now, I know Boston and Newport lay claim to her, too. But I consider her a, um, a Portsmouth uh, person. When she was a child for 14 summers, she came here to Portsmouth. Uh, as her mother got elderly, she came in and stayed with her at Oak Glen. When her mother died, she took over residence with her husband, artist John Elliott, and, and they, were, they were here. And um, she, um, she became president. Uh, she didn't want to become president. I'll read you what she had in her diary. This is September 6th, 1912. Miss Corin Mitchell asked me to take the presidency of the Newport County Suffrage League. I delayed decision, but I suppose I shall have, I shall in the end accept, unless we can find another person. With the heavy work I have undertaken as Secretary of the Art Association and for the Progressive Party, this seems like the last straw. Doesn't sound like she was too willing to do this. But once she took it on, she went in wholeheartedly. And um, you know, she, she did not believe in the militancy that Alva Belmont and some of the others or what was being done in England. But she had her own way of being uh, militant and strong. She was one of those that went to the state house and buttonholed the state legislators. That meant that they went to, into their offices and they wouldn't let them go. They kept talking about their suffrage cause. And, and um, the thing that I found most interesting, um, she had brought a lot of the Newport socialites into the Newport County uh, League. And um, two of them went with her when the aunties, which is the nickname for the, uh, those women that were against suffrage, they had rented the Colonial Theater and they brought in this speaker who was going to tell everyone why we shouldn't have female suffrage. And so um, Maud and these two ladies come in and they start peppering the lector the, the, the person that is giving the lecture with, with comments and questions, and he gets flustered, and the, the women that organize the events get flustered, and they walk out, and so Maud and the other two ladies 
get up front and they start preaching the suffrage cause. So, you know, I, I really thought that that was a really cool thing. But she brought in a lot of these Newport suffragists. Now, this is what I find ironic. I found this not in a Newport paper, but in a Boston paper. Mrs. Maud Howe Elliott is given back citizenship. Mrs. Maud Howe Elliott, daughter of Julia Ward Howe, author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, is once more an American citizen. She was naturalized today in the Superior Court, having applied for under the Act of Congress passed recently, permitting American-born women who had married foreign subjects to regain citizenship. Mrs. Elliot married John Elliot, a British subject, in Rome about 25 years ago, but despite her loss of citizenship, she had always been at heart a true American. She is living with her husband here. What happened to her was that there was a lot of anti-immigrant feeling. And so they passed a law that said that if a woman married uh, someone that had foreign citizenship, the American woman would lose her citizenship. Now, you think that would apply to men, but it didn't. <laughs> the men could, could, could marry a foreign, foreign, or, or foreign citizen, but nothing happened to them as far as their citizenship rights. So imagine Maud working all these years and everybody else getting to vote in 1920, but she had to wait three more years. Ironic, isn't it? So I want to, to talk a little bit about preparing for the vote because I thought that this was an interesting thing. Um, in my day, we used to have civics, and I think there was a little bit more instruction on how government works and functions. But for these women, um, the town of Portsmouth took them under their wing and helped them to understand the process that they would be going through. Um, 60 women met at St. Paul's uh, for instructions on how to vote, Clara May Miller was uh, selected the president or the chair of these women. That's her uh, portrait there. Her husband was a very famous artist named Oscar Miller, and his work is beautiful, as you can tell from her portrait. And um, so they had um, all kinds of, of uh, differing instructions. The uh, town clerk talked about the qualifications of the voter. There was a difference between people who owned property and people who didn't own property. So there was a different kind of registration. You seem to have more privileges if you own the property, but the women wouldn't have much property in their name. They, uh, Walter Chase talked about the role of the town committee and um, many suffrage workers were really looking forward to working on these Republican and Democratic committees. Um, Arthur Sherman and Representative Boyd from the state government told them how the state government worked. Earl Anthony told them about the school committee and the school department. And all the members of the town committees and the town council were there to answer questions. So I think that they did a nice job. This was in October of 1920, October 3rd. So a little bit more about Abby Sherman. Um, as a historian, one of the things that I love are primary sources um, like photos and newspapers and above all diaries. And Jim Garman did us a great favor a number of years ago. He was able to transcribe uh, parts of the diary of Abby Sherman. And so we have from her diary uh, what a real Portsmouth woman 
was feeling uh, as uh, she cast her first vote. Now, um, Abby was uh, from prominent Portsmouth families, Sissons and Elmes. Um, her, um, her husband and son were involved in politics, and she just wanted to be in that game. She wanted to be a worker, too. So June 8th of 1920, at 1 o'clock, I went down to the town hall and registered. Now I am a voter, or shall be after I vote. Who knows? But what I might be president of the United States. <laughs> Abby had lost no time in signing up to vote, but a Newport Mercury article in, in June um, gives us an idea that the clerk's office was flooded with people that came, women that came in to vote. And so the, the clerk was, was running around trying to get all these women registered and accommodated. And um, from September 30th, 1920, today happens the greatest event of our lives. That is, women will cast their first vote at the Republican caucus. It was a very quiet, pleasant meeting. We were welcomed cordially, and we were all interested and eager to know our duties. Now we are fellow workers. And then on November the 2nd, her first vote. Today we cast our ballot, the women of Portsmouth. Everything was conducted in a quiet manner. It was the greatest event of our lives. The men all said it was the best town meeting that we ever had. And from the newspaper account, the ladies were out in large numbers and did their voting, many of them going in the morning. One of the oldest women of town, Mrs. Letitia Freeborn, aged 82, was the first woman to enter the voting booth, but on account of poor eyesight, had to have the assistance of a supervisor, so was not the first woman to vote, to cast a ballot, but came second. Mrs. Harrison Peckham was next behind Mrs. Freeborn, and was the first woman to cast a vote. The voters from Prudence came over in an oyster boat, which was set for them by some of the candidates for office. The vote was met by automobiles. Many automobiles were used to go for voters at a distance. And, and so the women of the Newport County Suffrage League were not radical. They were just women who wanted to participate in the state and the town governing. So I can only tell you a short segment of what I've researched. And those of you who have them, I have more of these. I have a blog, it's called PortsmouthHistoryNotes.com. If you're interested in knowing more, I have larger blog articles on all the ladies that I was talking about. And um, in one of the uh, blogs, there is a uh, link to a PDF file. This is a little booklet that I put together, and it's called The Women of the Newport County Women's Suffrage League. And if you want that whole list, it's going to be, it's going to be there, and you can download it and, and use it. I just made enough copies to give to some libraries. But um, it is a fascinating topic, and it deserves much more time. But here we are, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Gloria? Wasn't that so fascinating? It was 100 years ago. Gloria, first of all, excellent talk. Thank you. Wonderfully. Thank you for that. You mentioned Abby Sherman. Yeah. Um, down Fairview Lane, on the north side, down the gravel road, there's a Sherman homestead. Could that have been where she lived? She was on Quaker Hill, right? Jim would know. Right, right at the top of Quaker Hill, where uh, the uh, sun, sun shop is. The barn was right there, and the house was across the street. They owned everything from the, the uh, East Main Road down to the water. That house, you're, oh, 
Sorry. The house you're talking about is the Philip Sherman House. He was the progenitor Sherman that came to this country. Um, and he has a lot of very famous descendants. Oh, thank you. It's a private home. Well, her, that's her, her marry that's me. A, that's her that's marry a, me. So probably she was a sisson and an alme. It's likely that all these Shermans are related. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in Portsmouth seems to be related to everybody else, it seems. <laughs> Does anyone else have another question? That was absolutely fascinating. Yes. Thank you. It was so good. We do have a lot of this information downstairs in our museum. Um, one of the most popular things that we have in the historical society is called the Julia Ward Howe Room. We have the cap that's in that picture, her writing desk, um, some of her clothing, copy of the Battle of the Republic, and people come from all over actually to see it. We're completely disheveled down there because we're moving things. The curators have been extremely busy. Um, but when we reopen, and if, you, if, if anybody wants to see it, we'd be happy to take you down there. Um, but you just have to know that we're not, we don't have our Sunday best on right now. No. Does anybody else have any questions for Gloria? Do you want to go back to the slide and leave it on that map for? Um, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> if you didn't get one of these, it, it just has my PortsmouthHistoryNotes.com. Everything that I research, that's my, that's my notebook. I, I try and put articles up there. And um, if, if you're interested, just use the search column and put in suffragist or whatever, and you'll find, you'll find them. But if you didn't get one of these, I'm going to put them uh, on the front, and you can uh, take one with you. But uh, it's, it's been a fascinating uh, exploration. Um, what I'm on right now is uh, researching uh, the arts in Portsmouth, especially the artists. And so that will be next year. The social studio is actually for sale right now. It's right across the street from Julia Ward. I'm at the Bristol Ferry Road, yes. 397. Yes. So I'm going to put that on our website. I don't know that we can get in to see it, but you can drive by and look at the for sale sign and know where it is. It's, it's hard to find. March and I had a hard time finding it. The only way we found it was that map, and we could kind of trace it from that because it's set back. But it's a beautiful piece of property, and if you go inside, and you can really see, you can really imagine, um, looking at the old photos and postcards, you can see where the inside, they, they added on enough to make it a family dwelling, but they kept that original um, flavor to the building. Does it make you feel like you know so much more about your own town? Yeah. Like the, you're a little more bonded to this place if you're from Portsmouth. All those familiar names. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All those street names. Yeah. Oh, yeah.